And finally, when somebody gives you unsolicited advice, ooh, child, I have used every single one of these, a variation of these. Welcome to Amy Liz Harrison's podcast, Eternally Amy, a mum of eight's journey from jail to joy. A Gen Xer who overcame her struggle with alcohol to become a best-selling author and mental health advocate. She shares stories of hope and offers ideas for others struggling with mental health challenges, spirituality, ADHD, or maybe just family, travel, and logistics. One thing is for sure, you'll leave with something to chew on. And now, here's your host, Amy Liz Harrison, with your mystery meat sandwich. Greetings, compadres. Well, your mystery meat sandwich today is courtesy of Oscar Wilde. To love oneself is the beginning of a lifelong romance. Okay, so listen, people. During the pandemic, it was April 2020, and it was still freezing cold here in Seattle. I went on Amazon one day. And to what did my wandering eyes appear but a shave ice machine? Not just like one of those Snoopy snow cone shave ice machines that I always wanted as a kid, but I'm talking like a commercial massive shave ice machine with all the bells and whistles. What do I happen to have? With eight children. One has some appliances that are not exactly necessary, but really nice to have. Like, for example, two dishwashers, that kind of thing, you know, that just kind of makes large family living easier. So one of those appliances that I happen to have is a commercial ice maker. And I'm here to tell you that shave ice machine and I began a love affair of epic proportions. I ate shave ice during the pandemic as if my very life depended on it. And now I can't even get shave ice in Hawaii because I like the way that I do it at home on my machine, which admittedly is kind of messed up, but it's also kind of fabulous depending on how you look at it. And what can I say? But dude, I'm basically not mad at it, not even slightly. It's kind of messed up, but it's also kind of fabulous, depending on how you look at it. And I'm not mad at that at all, not even slightly. It definitely feels, for me, like a form of self-care and not for one second will I apologize for it. So that's what I have to say about that today. When in doubt, Go on Amazon and show some self-care to yourself by purchasing a commercial shave ice machine that takes up far too much counter space, by the way, just a warning, but will bring you unmeasured happiness and joy. At least it did for me. And now on to the chaplain's chat. For the chaplet's chat, have you seen the movie Dodgeball? It's got Ben Stiller in it, and there is a character in there named Patches O'Houlihan. And this guy is like a worn out, washed out old dude who was like the first dodgeball champion ever in the movie, right? And it's an instructional video for the American Dodgeball Association. (laughs) And I know you're probably like, what does this have to do with ADHD and early recovery and what players in the game of life? What? So I'll explain it. Let me unpack this for a second. I don't think there's a lot in my life that makes me more uncomfortable than having to have a difficult or crunchy conversation. And then there's just the word boundaries. 
So it's a word that gets thrown around a lot in early sobriety. It can be really tough to even determine what those are. Or if you're like new to therapy, you're new to the world of self-actualization, self-knowledge, if you're kind of brand new to all of that, you may not have heard that word before, but it's also a church word. So if you have grown up in the church or currently in the church, or if you've read that uh, that Townsend book, Boundaries, yeah, you've probably heard of them before. And it's a little bit of a buzzword, you know, it's trending. It goes away and then it's trending again. And you know what, I'll tell you, there are certainly some very damn good reasons for boundaries. And they're very necessary once you reach that threshold where you definitely, at least for me, have the desire to stay sober and to cultivate positive energy and positive people in your life. And you're trying to create a positive outlook on who you are and how you operate in the world. So some people I have found anyway are serious boundaries ninjas. And I'm basically not one of them. I'm here to tell you. In early sobriety, it basically just completely removed myself from any situation that would involve setting boundaries at all. Meaning there were certain people I just completely and totally avoided. And if I ran into one of them, I literally would run away. And I'm not even kidding. This happened like four times. And now I can see those people, but I'm still very cognizant of how I react to them and what my job is in those situations and really what it is to put up and maintain a fence around my sobriety, my heart, my life, my mental and emotional state, and ensure that nobody goes through the gates of that fence. So as I've talked about a lot before, I've lost a lot of my brain cells from so many pregnancies and it was totally worth it. But as a result, I need to have very simple things that I can remember easily so that especially when I'm in a situation where I'm emotional or potentially emotional, I don't get all tongue-tied and forget what I'm trying to say, Uh, which, by the way, has happened to me. I can think of a time where I was out to dinner with a family member, and they asked if it was okay if they ordered a beer, and it was 100% not okay with me. I was feeling super fragile that day, and I was about a week home from treatment but I just got super tongue-tied and I could not figure out what to say. So in that instance, it would have really helped for me to have a little catchphrase or a party line or some kind of a thing to draw back on from the depths and bowels of my memory where I could pull out a phrase and just say it. And that's why if you're in the 12-step community, They have all those little sayings. Easy does it. First things first, right? Think, 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 that kind of stuff. Because when you're in a head spin and you're thinking about drinking, the last thing you need is some big, you know, 14 step process in trying to remember oh, wait, what am I supposed to do here? Wait, what was that thing? What did I write down? What did I learn from that YouTube video, right? So keep listening and you will hear some of those party lines and they really don't require a lot of thought. I'm gonna talk more about them in a later section, but the basic skeleton system for communication in crunchy conversations particularly with boundary setting or dealing with toxic people or dealing with manipulators, narcissists, or basically any other crunchy conversation. Maybe it's a customer service experience. Maybe, you know, it's a neighbor who's kind of grumpy and there's some kind of a beef happening. 
Maybe it's another fellow parent, okay? So this is a system that I basically (laughs) stole the name. After watching the movie Dodgeball, I developed this little, I'll call it a system, but it's really not a system, okay? But it's uh, skeletoned or formatted off of the Patches O'Houlihan rules for Dodgeball. In the movie Dodgeball, of course. So if you haven't seen it, or if you don't like it, basically, I'm sorry, but we can't be friends. If you haven't seen it, we can be. Just go see it. And then you have to like it, apparently. I'm just kidding. Okay. Lastly, before I launch into it, I will say that if you have ADHD, or like me, a general case of CRS or can't remember shit. So I have both of those, as you know. And not just if you're in early sobriety, but for basically just any situation where you may deal with other human beings, okay? Uh, This will help you, hopefully, to gain a little nugget of something that you can use in a future crunchy conversation because You know they're coming for you. You know they are. We just can't seem to escape them. Somehow they pop up and they usually pop up when I'm in a, you know, state of mind where I really feel like I can't handle it or I feel overwhelmed, tired, super fatigued, stressed out, whatever. And so I needed something that I could kind of fall back on to help me navigate a crunchy conversation. First, oh, P.S., by the way, if you don't remember what the dodgeball movie rules were from Patches O'Houlihan, which I just like to say that name, Patches (laughs) O'Houlihan, what it is is a, a set of D's. It's dodge, duck dip, dive, and I guess he couldn't think of anything else to say or they wanted the character not to be able to remember that he had already said it, so dodge is the last one again. All right, without further ado, dodgeball conversations for those with ADHD, early recovery, or for those who deal with other players in the game of life. Okay, first, dodge. How do I want to show up? So the reason dodge is important is because we want to play the movie, the proverbial movie, not dodgeball per se, but the proverbial movie of whatever it is that we're dealing with all the way through to the very ending credits. So we want to figure out, gosh, you know, how do I want to exit this? How can I exit this conversation and feel good about myself? How can I Take this incident and then walk away and not feel a bunch of shame, feel a bunch of anger at the way I behaved or reacted. How can I respond instead of react? So what can sometimes happen in discussions is people, myself, for example, will get all discombobulated and twisted and turned upside down in the discussion as it goes along. And I'm telling you, I have fallen victim to this more often in my lifetime than is totally necessary. And shame on me, because now that I know better, I need to do better, right? So what happens is, is I start to have something come up in my life that immediately causes cognitive dissonance in me or is kind of like, I don't know, just tap dances on that nerve of being offensive. Or if a person will start on a tirade that I've heard 50 times before and I'm starting to really recognize it in my body, my chest is tight maybe, anxiety is kind of creeping in, maybe some anger or a little touch of like rage, for example. (laughs) What will happen once that hot topic is brought up is it's like I'll get these red flags, right? And, you know, people. They don't often do things to me or to you. They often just do what they do. But 
it doesn't mean that they're not harming anybody in the process, right? It's just that people are people. So why should it be? You and I could get along so awfully. People are people. Remember that song? I'm sorry. I totally started off off key. So I apologize. But what can I say? I can't sing anymore. So it is what it is. Anyway, people will do things. And sometimes people do it intentionally and sometimes unintentionally. But they will throw a pebble in the water. Okay, and that pebble will cause ripple effects. Sometimes they know it and sometimes they don't. Okay, and occasionally people will just say something to get a rise out of you, and they might just be trying to poke the bear on purpose. But essentially, more often than not, I find that people just do what they do. Because that that's how they are, right? And I think it's just important for us to remind ourselves that it's not our circus, it's not our monkeys. And I have finally learned in life that there are people who are never going to change the way that they are, right? There are some people who aren't capable of changing, right? And what we don't transform, we definitely transmit, right? And so it's not a surprise that the ripple effect will start to appear and then you maybe or I experience a level of cognitive dissonance over something they said, over some hot topic. People just, you know, sometimes they aren't open to self-improvement. Uh, they can just randomly, you know, they have zero self-awareness. Sometimes it's a general um, sense of something that has been set in place, a pattern, maybe since they were very little and they can't see outside of their own self, okay? They don't have any perspective. They don't have any peripheral vision and they don't have a sense of viewing themselves from somebody else's eyes and how the context of what they're saying might affect another human being or the content of what they're saying, content and context. And this is why it's so important to take care of ourselves so that by default, we're taking care of other people. So these folks are just, they're kind of like, a dog who just went swimming and it was maybe in a river or whatever where that pebble was thrown, a lake. Okay, so a body of still water. So let's say a lake for the sake of this example. <laughs> dog just climbed out of the lake where it was swimming and the dog is soaking wet. And so it just shakes all of the water off of its coat of fur and there are just those little water droplets everywhere, flying all over the place, hitting other people. But the dog isn't necessarily intending to spray others and irritate them. The dog is just doing what the dog organically does. There are also some people, by the way, who generationally just don't even see that their opinion is not factual, is not a fact. Just because you think it, or this is your opinion doesn't mean that it is right for everybody else. And that's really tough. A lot of times the older generations, they've not been introduced to any kind of processing group or therapy group or counselor or anything like that. And so they literally can't see past these blinders. So the point is, you can say to yourself in this dodge phase, okay, hold on a minute. Let me think about how it is that I want to show up and how do I want to feel at the end of this conversation. And then when a hot topic comes up from somebody else, you can remind yourself, wait a minute, I played the movie all the way through to the ending credits. And what was it that I wanted to see rolling on the screen? 
oh, okay, yeah, that's right. I wanted to feel good about myself and feel like I didn't cause any additional harm. That's how I want to feel anyway. That's the one that I use most of the time. Now, of course, sometimes you can't get away with dodging the ball or dodging the issue. And so the dodge involves just simply changing the subject, right? Or just kind of excusing yourself from that conversation, which is in and of itself a little bit crunchy sometimes. But if you can't figure a way to guide, figure out a way to guide the conversation, then sometimes the best thing to do to protect yourself and others is just to eliminate that conversation and just to excuse yourself. Which brings me to the second point, which is duck. So here's a question to ask yourself in the duck phase. Do I need to duck? And that is when you ask yourself, hey, how important is this? Is it critical that I give this feedback? Is it harmful if I don't give it? And I'm just not talking about only like feelings wise, like, oh, I'm going to feel terrible if I don't give this feedback at this particular level of honesty, or I'm going to feel yucky like I've been maybe walked on. I'm talking about uh, will someone die, right? Will someone be bleeding if I don't participate in this conversation? Or if I don't give this piece of feedback or talk to this person, how critical is this, right? Is this going to affect like future generations to come of our family? Usually the answer is no for me. So the solution for me that I have found works the very best is to take the page from Nancy Reagan and just say no to the drugs campaign in the 1980s, remember? And just inside my head, I just say to myself, no, I'm not going to engage in this because it is not worth it. Okay. So in that case, I'm basically granting myself permission. I'm giving myself a permission slip. Okay. To back out of that conversation, which is not Super unlike the first idea of dodging, right? Asking myself, how do I want to show up and what is basically required? This is the actual, I'm going to duck. I'm ducking out of this right now. So I'll give you an example. Let's say there's someone in your immediate family who's extremely opinionated or not yours, maybe a friend of yours, right? <laughs> And they're really pushy with their views. And let's say it's a hot topic. It's political or it's religious or at some level it's incendiary. It is some topic that creates a lot of emotional response in people. So these are not exactly table talk conversations, okay, or grocery store line conversations. These folks are agenda pushers. I also like to call them pot stirrers. They like to stir the pot. And they want to get a rise out of you because what they want to do is convince you of their viewpoint, right? Um, If it's a religious person, sometimes they think that they are called to have this conversation with you or correct you, quote, in love, unquote. I don't have like any bitterness over any of that and no personal experience with it. So I have a term for this that I learned over the years of recovery that I like to use. And it is making others live inside your version of right and wrong. And so when people do this to each other, and I know because I have been this person in my past life, and I'm one to tell you that it doesn't go very well. Okay. So when others make you live or try to make you live inside their version of right and wrong, you start to immediately feel it, right? Like you can feel it in your body. 
And I know because I have actually seen people react in the past. I have memories of this, right? When I've said something that has burned a bridge or has burned a relationship by, you know, me being my pushy self, right? Uh, pushing my views or agendas or not giving a hoot about who my audience is and karma because now in recovery, I've got all these tools and, you know, it's like I have more opportunities to use aforementioned tools. And because I've been on the receiving end of when others try and make me live inside their version of right and wrong. Uh, it's really tricky when, you know, it's somebody that you don't really have a lot of choice in dealing with. So perhaps it's a family member, friend, colleague. And what I have found is I find myself actually physically backing up like walking backwards away from the person or trying to move away from them. And sometimes that person will follow you or increasingly move forward, right? As I back up, they're moving forward and they continue their diatribe of opinion and how they see the world and that you should too and it's super frustrating because you're trying to remove yourself from the conversation and the situation. And the person is essentially trying not to let you do that. It's very intrusive and it's very belittling and you can feel very stuck. So when you're in a position where you cannot get away from that person, you got to come up with a couple tools. And I got some good ones in the next section that hopefully will help you to uh, dip and dive. And the first one, dip, you're going to dip into redirection. So this is the first really valuable tool in conversation. When you see a conversation kind of take a turn, right? So we go to, or we used to go to, past tense, a family camp every year pre-COVID when I was growing up, where they had these rowboats in this canal, and you could rent out a rowboat and go down and use it, these big old metal rowboats. And I've also done this in a river where you're uh, kind of, I, I'll say it, you know, look, okay, I think it, it goes without saying I am not um, a maritime expert. I am not a sea lady by nature. Um, I do have my boater's license, but that is because I figured out how to take the test and pass it easily without much effort. Okay. So I don't know a lot about boating, but I know this. If you stick to kind of the middle of the river or the canal, uh, if you don't get too close to the shoreline, it's really kind of the best case scenario because you know, then you can start rowing. You're rowing in the same direction as your partner. You can communicate. There's nothing really hindering you. You just kind of have to look out for other uh, boats or vessels around you. And you just kind of enjoy yourself, right? But if you get too close to the shoreline, you start bumping up and down against the rocks on the riverbed. Um, and or at least at this particular camp that I went to all those years. So not only can you damage the boat itself, but you're also traveling slower because the riverbed materials are then kind of starting to slow you down pretty soon. And, you know, potentially uh, you could create a hole in the boat or just get stuck, get your paddle stuck like in that sediment. And basically, not fantastic things can happen while you are rowing. So if your plan is to continue to proceed down the stream of light positively, sometimes you need to, or I need to, make a change. And you need to steer and get that paddle up and out of that sediment. 
And you need to kind of redirect back to the middle of the river or the canal. So you kind of just get back into the flow. And then you can do the same thing in a crunchy conversation. And what I mean by this is you just straight up change the subject. Again, that's going to feel a little bit awkward, but you just go, hey, so tell me about your son, Josh. Or, hey, didn't you go on a trip to Boston? You know, did you happen to see like Paul Revere's grave? I don't even know. Whatever. Okay. One of the best ways that I have found to do this where I don't have to think too much and get too caught up in the conversation and potentially get kind of emotionally spun out is to do that HPT test, which I won't go very much into detail on this episode of the podcast. Uh, I, I will take us way off track, but, and I'm already pretty good at getting us off track, but I can guarantee this can be a little secret weapon as it is for me. And I'm happy to share tools. That's what I do because they may or may not work with you because tools were shared with me. But I can almost guarantee you that nobody's going to call you out for switching topics mid-conversation. And then, of course, you can always blame ADHD if you have that. Be like, oh, sorry, like squirrel, I just totally changed the subject. Sorry. And then you change it anyway, right? You keep going. <laughs> so, yeah, no one's going to call you out for switching topics um, and bringing up something seemingly off topic because it is. And no one's going to respond with, you know, hey, are you doing the house tree person test on me? Yeah, no one's going to do that. And if they do, uh, you can just say, yeah, I am. <laughs> okay, so that is uh, it's a psychological test. And we'll, again, we'll go into that another time. But if you just picture a house... You can like, so, so picture like you're a kid, right? And in class, you're supposed to take out a piece of construction paper and maybe a Mr. Sketch smelly marker, right? And of course you choose the blue because it smells like blueberry and it's amazing. Uh, but anyway, you picture yourself like drawing a house and then drawing a tree and then drawing a person standing outside the house or under the tree. So again, I'm not going to go into a ton of details, but essentially this test was initially regarded as a measure of determining whether or not a person had schizophrenia. Uh, so maybe that's what you can do is just go, I'm just trying to tell if this person has schizophrenia or not. It's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. So Look, we're all challenged with different mental or untreated conditions. None of us are perfect human beings. There isn't such a thing. We all have idiosyncrasies and delusions because we see the world through our own lens. And that's just universal, man. So the lenses are different. The way we see the world through our own lens, whatever that may be. That's just a thing that unifies us, right? So it kind of just levels the playing field. So you can stop in mid-conversation with somebody who needs to be redirected and think to yourself, okay, here's a specimen of humanity who also has challenges and issues like I do. And those issues are starting to spray out in a manner that I'm not feeling safe with. And so I'm going to redirect this conversation so that it brings an element of safety back. And so you picture in that moment, as you've said, okay, we're both humans, we have our issues, and you start looking at it through that psychological lens, and you picture the drawing of this house and a person and a tree. You're not gonna actually have them take the test, but you can think, all right, I'm gonna ask the person about where they live. And about what they enjoy doing about where they are in the place where they live. So like you might say, for example, yeah, so how do you like living in Sioux Falls, right? And then 
What do you do there for fun? What's like your favorite activity in the summertime or the wintertime? So you're trying to create a rapport. Then for the person, I can ask them, you know, what else do you like to do just in your free time? What do you want to do like on any given free Saturday? And you can ask them what their passions are. You can kind of just let the conversation go from there. So if you can't think of anything to ask, just picture a house a child's drawing with a house, a person under a tree, standing next to a tree, and then ask them things about, you know, their person, where they live, or what they do. Don't forget, too, that they are just another human being, and you get to be in charge of how the conversation goes if you're willing to have it maybe potentially be a little awkward and switch the conversation up, right? Also, one last little tidbit there about the house person tree. When you picture that drawing, you can also ask them about the past, present, and future of all of these subjects. You could say, I'm just going to give you some examples here real quick before moving on to the next thing. Hey, what was one thing you really liked about where you grew up? Where do you see yourself maybe uh, living in the future? Or what is one thing you used to love doing when you were a kid? What's something you could see yourself getting into as a senior citizen someday? Like, do you think you would make a good Walmart greeter, for example? What are some trips you've been on in the past that you really enjoyed? Do you travel much? What was your least favorite place and why? So if this is a stranger, you can ask that person, you know, very generally these, you know, if somebody is feeling like this is too intrusive, you can soften it up by saying, you know, where would you imagine that you might like to live? like another country, maybe, you know, you can keep it super general. All right. And now we're going to get a little more specific with these party lines, these slogans, these things that you don't have to think too hard. If you need an escape route, you need to pull something out, you need to uh, just maybe, maybe memorize a phrase, okay, that you can just boom. Um, shoot at them, not shoot literally, but shoot like a spider web at them. So this is dive. Dive into boundary setting. So in essence, when you follow these ideas, okay, you're just looking out for yourself. And really, you're in a fight for yourself if you're trying to get sober, right? Or if you're just trying to create a positive, um, esteemable acts situation or self-image, right? So in order not to have the consequences in life where you're just feeling sucked down and walked on from a conversation or a narcissist is trying to control you, you're going to have to sacrifice a little um, tiny bit of uncomfortability uh, in order to maintain your personal integrity and identity. At least that is how it works for me. Okay. So it's not acceptable to, you know, stand there and let somebody kind of just get all up in your grill. It doesn't feel good and it's super damaging. I'll speak for myself. For me, it is. Okay. So in order to withstand the retaliation, you need to experience a setting of firm boundaries and a maintenance of it. And it is really uncomfortable first, (laughs) at first for an experience. But if you remain strong, you remain steadfast and with a little bit of practice, you know, it gets easier over time. I don't love it personally, but I love the results. So I know it's worth it. So just a quick little plug to remind yourself never to give up on yourself ever, ever. All right, here are some of the party lines. So you have to say these with empathy, okay? All right, here we go. You could say to somebody who's just talking, 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 
about something they're wanting you to co-sign on. You could say, interesting. Or you could say, how about that? Now, remember too, um, these are active listening comments, but you don't actually have to listen actively to throw these phrases out there. So there have been times when someone is just going off about some random thing that's starting to kind of stir me up a little bit. And I just smile and nod and think about something else. <laughs> I, I Seriously, I'm sorry, just full disclosure. So here are some boundary or enforcement um, or disagreement, you know, somewhere where you need to make a change, right? Where you're like, oh, this is really that red flag coming up. This is it. Okay. You can say, well, I see it differently than you do. Or I can see that really works for you. Or thank you for sharing. We differ on this. Or I have a different perspective. Or thank you. I actually kind of disagree with that approach. And you can engage in here's why if you feel comfortable. But I don't. I never use that one. It's very rare. But hey, I have it in my toolbox, right? And there may be a time where I need it, where it is appropriate for me to say that, to say something where that's needed based on whatever's happening in the conversation. Thank you. It is not up for debate or negotiation. Another good party line. And that one I most often use with kids. Yep. Here's another one. You know, I'd like to step back and look at the bigger picture together because I think there are a number of other areas that are important for us to consider. And that's really kind of a mouthful, but it's a good all-encompassing way of showing the person, you know what, there's more than one point of view on this, right? Here's another party line. Let's switch gears and talk about something else. Perfect for me. Short and sweet, right? Now, <laughs> I'm also in the dive section of this episode going to give you some things to say if you're put on the spot against your will, okay? You know what? This isn't my area of expertise, but I can find out for you. And that just kind of disengages you from having to scramble and figure something out to say, right? Or you can say, I don't remember off the top of my head. I'll check my notes and I'll get back to you. And usually the person won't even remember, I mean, that you said that. It's not like they're going to email you next week and go, hey, did you check your notes? They might. It hasn't happened to me. Here's another one. I want to be sure to give you the correct information. So let me figure it out and call you back or get back with you. Here's another one. Again, we're talking about when you're put on the spot against your will, things you can say. I've been wondering that too. Let's ask. Or I'm not sure. I don't know what it is with us 80s and 90s kids, particularly in the church, particularly females who feel like it's not okay to say we don't know, but it's really okay and it's very empowering. Okay, here's another one. You know what? Hey, so-and-so over there by the tree might be able to answer your question. So that's a good one too, because there you go. Pass the buck and pass the person off to somebody else. I'm sorry, but I've done this. And you know what? Usually it works so well because that person is more than happy to talk about whatever it is or, you know, happy to engage in this person's um, conversation. And usually this will happen. A perfect example is, you know, what are your thoughts on the COVID vaccine? Like, I'm not going to stand here and talk to you about this. Like, we're not going to get engaged in this. So, you know, if you want to do it, you can say, based on the information I have, this is what I think. And then you can launch into it. Or you could just say, you know, I want to be sure and give you um, the correct information about what you're asking. My opinion um, is 
based off of science? You can say whatever, right? That's a good question, right? That's a good question. I don't know. What do you think? You could shoot it back to them. What do you think about it? And then they'll tell you. And if you listen, you'll understand that you're given clues now as to how they feel about it. And you can take that information and go, oh, you know what? That's a good question. I'll see what I can find out. It's a good question. Maybe I'll research it a little more. Or I've been wondering that too. I, I just don't really know. All right. Next part of dive is when someone is trying to wear you down. Okay, here's some phrases to say for that. I'd like to take a break and come back to this in a couple of hours. We can think about it. Let's circle back on this. You can say, I'm feeling overwhelmed right now, so it's hard for me to focus. You could say, I'm a little bit surprised, or this is a lot to take in. Okay? Or if it seems like the person is still talking and you want to end it, even though they're still trying to go on and on and on, you could say, oh, it appears that we're kind of deadlocked here. And so let's go ahead and table it or get a third party in here because your solution is for me to give in and see it your way. And I don't know how to break this deadlock. So what's an efficient way to maybe get this worked out. Yes, I'm sorry, but the mediator thing is huge because sometimes you're talking up here at this level, somebody else is talking over here about this and you just can't seem to even, you're not, you see that you're not on the same level, but you can't make the other person see that. And that's difficult. Here's another one. You know what? I'm not prepared to discuss this any longer. So let's just table it. Okay, there's also a saying, uh, when somebody knows how to push your buttons, there's this saying, for example, family knows how to push your buttons because they're the ones who installed them. Have you ever heard that? So here are some things you can say in those circumstances where someone's pushing your buttons or just doing what they do, right? Here we go. I'm putting my needs first and I'm going to go ahead and exit out of this conversation. This one is, it could go either way. I'd be careful this with this one. I've never actually said this one. <laughs> Not yet. Knock on wood. But another one is, you know what? I bet you a great therapist could help with that. And really, they can help you process this in a healthy way. And that second part is really, I'm going to say less, it gives less potential to create some kind of a fiery, um, not helpful, throw gasoline on that, uh, that hot tamale <laughs> situation. Okay, here's another one. That sounds kind of toxic. You might want to consider seeing a professional who can give you some tools. I have said that one. Here's another one. Let's avoid deflecting and bring it back around to the conversation at hand or to the topic at hand. I don't really use that one. Some of these I can't say um, calmly or with a sense of genuine empathy. It's like fostered, manufactured empathy. And so, you know, it just depends on the conversation and the person. Here are some more. You know what? I don't feel like I've had a chance to voice my opinion. Here's another one. I feel shut out when you take over the conversation and you're not hearing me. Here's another one. I understand how you feel. And here, now let's talk about how I feel. I would never say that one, by the way. <laughs> I would probably word it very differently, but that is one that I have learned from my psychiatrist that I love a lot um, because it challenges me. I've never used it. I, I think I would never say it, but maybe I would. And maybe I need to get comfortable with what I fear about saying that, right? Okay, here's another one. You know what? I feel undermined when you bring this up in front of everybody. So next time, just speak to me about it in private. 
Here's another one. You know what? I'd appreciate it if you didn't talk to, and then in parentheses, whoever it is, right? Your mom, my mom, your coworkers, your kid, your goat, your cat, whatever. I'd appreciate it if you didn't talk to that person about my private life. Okay, here's another one. And this could be used with some parents if you're an adult. Hey, you know what? I'm an adult and I am capable of making my own decisions. Thank you for your concern. I love this one. And I usually don't use this exact wording, but some form of these words or this phrase. Hey, you know what? My reasons are personal and I don't really have to explain them to you. Okay. You can also say, I prefer not to say. Some people will jokingly say, I plead the fifth, right? Uh, You can say, oh, this is a good one here. And I have said this. I won't allow you to use guilt to control me. Right? Here's another one. My feelings are as equally important as yours. Here's another one. If you choose to ignore me, that's your problem and not mine. So you can be clear about kind of whose circus, whose monkeys, right? And finally, when somebody gives you unsolicited advice, ooh, child, I have used every single one of these, a variation of these, okay? First one is, let's focus on the task at hand And then later we can talk about different suggestions. Because when you're the PTA president child, you get a lot of folks who will offer uh, their help in the way of advice and things that you should do, but they're not willing to do it. So that's when you say, I like that idea. Would you like to be the lead on this? Here's another one. I'm grateful for your advice, but I'm going to try something else. Here's another one. You've given me a lot to think about. Thank you. Here's another one. That may have been the case in your situation, but in this situation, I'm dealing with whatever, and we're going to go a different route. Here's another one. I've never thought about that. And that's just kind of like a flat, Boom, (laughs) drop mic. I'm not committing to anything, right? Here's another one. I understand why you think that that might work, but here's why it won't. And then you can explain if you want, or you can say, you know what? I appreciate that. We've tried it in the past. And then it just kind of puts that to bed, which is always my favorite type of phrase, the one that doesn't require further conversation. Here's another one. I want to understand what you're trying to accomplish with this feedback. Can you explain kind of your thinking, your reasoning behind it? And then here's another one. Thanks for offering to help my boss, husband, uh, the principal, whatever, prefers that I handle the request. So it's just a way of using these little phrases that are kind always kind, but they just, they help you to put the kibosh on somebody else, you know, stick in their beacon or for lack of a better term, you know, or um, trying to get you to do something that they want you to do, right? And you can always say, And these ones are my favorite, just the really short, thanks for the feedback. You don't have to do anything with it. You're not obligated to do anything with it. You're not going to lose sleep over it. There is not a REM cycle that will be missed. And so circling back to Patches O'Houlihan and his last rule (laughs) for the game of dodgeball, how do I want to show up? And as long as you keep that in mind, You cannot fail, I have found, because I know that I want to show up with kindness and love and tolerance 
as my code. That's how I want to show up. That's what I want to practice. And practice doesn't mean I do it perfectly. It means I practice it. Finally, here's your bailout bag. So for the bailout bag, learning to be a boundary boss is not easy, right? But the rewards are worth it. At least I think so. So I think it is a way of honoring yourself and practicing self-care. And it's really a way of honoring the relationship with the person you're setting the boundary up with. Simple, but not easy. Hopefully you've gained some information or some things to consider as you practice dodgeball conversations yourself. All right, because... You know, a lot of us have ADHD or we're in early recovery or we're just a person, right? We need to figure out how to deal with other players in the game of life. Be kind, rewind, and thank you for the honor of your time. Remember always, guys, to take what you like and leave the rest behind. Thank you so much for listening to Eternally Amy. Amy Liz Harrison is a best-selling author, speaker, 12-step coach, meditation teacher, and recovery advocate. To find out more, please visit amylizharrison.com. Keep up with Amy on all platforms by following at Amy Liz Harrison. Please subscribe and review this podcast. It means so much to us if you do.